Greetings, dear saint, in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, welcome to the final installment of the series entitled, Jesus, Friend of Sinners. And we're looking at how Jesus was designated by the world as a friend of sinners, as our Lord and Savior, which is very significant for us and has implications in terms of our understanding of who Christ is, his heart for the church, his heart for the prodigals, his heart for the lost, his heart for us. And of course, implications as well in terms of how we manifest Jesus Christ to the world. Can we also be called a friend of sinners in terms of what it means biblically, like Jesus, our Lord and Savior, was called? So today I'm going to read from the book of John chapter 4, verse 4 through to verse 30. And this is Jesus' encounter with the woman at the well. And this is in Samaria. Verse 4 of John chapter 4. Now he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about the sixth hour. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You're a Jew, and I'm a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, You have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his flocks and his herds? Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't have to get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. He told her, Go, call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, You are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is, you have had five husbands, and the man you, are, you have now is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our father worshipped on this mountain. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus declared, Believe me, woman, a time is coming when you worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come where the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshippers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshippers must worship in spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know that Messiah, called Christ, is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I who speak to you am he. Just then his disciples returned and were surprised to find him talking with a woman. But no one asked, What do you want, or why are you talking with her? Then, leaving her water jar, the woman went back into the town and said to the people, Come, see a man who has told me everything I ever did. Could that be the Christ? They came out of the town and made their way toward him. We thank the Lord for his wonderful and precious word. What a wonderful, amazing encounter between Jesus and the Samaritan woman. And of course, by this time, there was a huge gulf between the Jews and the Samaritans in many ways because of uh, ethnicity, because of uh, religious beliefs. Uh, the Jews did not like the Samaritans because the Samaritans represented spiritual syncretism, spiritual compromise, and uh, their background was questionable. They claimed to have um, to also be descendants, Jewish descendants, and uh, from followers of Moses and uh, the way of the truth. But the Jews obviously believed otherwise, and uh, the Samaritans contended against this. So there was a lot of contention. There were always counter-accusations that had been happening for centuries before this time. 
The Samaritans considered Jews uh, terrorists. The Jews considered Samaritans terrorists as well. So it was quite a strange thing and anathema that the Lord would be found talking not only to a Samaritan, but a Samaritan woman for that. So this is quite an amazing story and we're going to learn from this just the heart of the Lord and what it means when the Bible tells us that Jesus is a friend of sinners and the lessons we can draw from this. And following up to that, the first thing that strikes me about this story is that it shows that Jesus made himself radically accessible. He went all out. He went the extra mile to be accessible to this woman. The Bible says this was at the sixth hour, so this was about at noon, which is actually an odd time for women to go to the well. So many theologians believe that this woman was there because possibly of her reputation. Uh, the fact that she had had several husbands and things were not going well with her and perhaps other things. Because most women would normally go to the well early in the morning or um, at dusk later on when it's cooler. But she was there at this time, at a strange time. And Jesus made sure he came at that particular time. And it appears he came specifically for this woman because the Lord God had already told him what the story was. So Jesus chose to make himself accessible even um, at the possibility of being controversial. Even when the disciples came, the, the Bible tells us that they were found it very odd. They must have had uh, weird stares at each other. But they were afraid to ask him. Um, but in their minds, uh, they had this question, why is he talking to a Samaritan and a woman for that matter? So there was great controversy. And Jesus knew he was risking controversy. But when the Lord has an assignment, he doesn't care about the controversy. So saints, when we're talking about being a friend of sinners, as Jesus was, we need to be ready to be radically accessible, to be deliberately visible, intentionally visible in the way we present ourselves, whether it's the people you work with, the people you go to school with, and so forth. I remember one time when I was on campus and uh, my faith was beginning to grow and I felt God challenging me to share my faith with people, but I was very shy and I didn't know what to do. And the Lord said, just start with carrying your Bible around with you. Don't look for a podium or stand on a hill and start shouting and look for a microphone. You don't have to do that. Just find one thing that is going to provoke conversation. So I started carrying my Bible with me. And sure enough, it would stimulate conversation. I wouldn't have to work too hard to try and think or to try and put together some cogent argument to impress people. Just carrying my Bible with me, which was a big deal for me at that time. And today when people do things like, for instance, uh, bumper stickers and people berate that. And of course, it shouldn't just be done for the sake of it. Because there's no point putting a bumper sticker when you don't intend um, to sincerely follow and manifest the character of Christ. But if done sincerely, putting that bumper sticker, or it could be perhaps carrying a personal tract with your testimony. You may find it difficult to start talking about it, but if you print out a little tract, keep it with you, you come across someone, you feel led to talk to them, you can ask them, can I give you this tract? Are you willing to read? Just a very short thing, maybe 50 words about what Jesus means to you or what is done for you. And already you're making yourself accessible and they can ask more questions and you can invite them to church. But saints, we have to be radically accessible. One of the things that I was beginning to shy away was uh, from letting people know that I'm a pastor when I travel because of the many controversies that many pastors in this present age uh, stir up. Um, many people have been swindled by pastors. Uh, pastors have been involved in sexual scandals and I was beginning to feel embarrassed sometimes to call myself a pastor because many pastors have been associated with charlatanism and hypocrisy. But the Lord began to convict me and he said, yes, it's important not to be a hypocrite, but don't hide because you don't know someone else who will, have, who will find that as a way of approaching you and make, it may make you accessible. It may stir questions in people's minds. Even if you're going to be possibly at some points associated with the controversial guys, but not everyone will look at it that way, and some will find it as a starting point for spiritual conversation. So we must be accessible. The second thing that I want to talk about is that Jesus also presents what I would like to call a 3D gospel. In other words, a proper, balanced, and complete presentation of the truth. Again, we live in a world today where the gospel is essentially commercialized. In more ways than one. Firstly, of course, in the sense that it's being used as a way of making money. Uh, 
by many different ministers and uh, they do fundraising and they trick people to say if you give at this particular window and in this particular way and in these particular multiples uh, you're going to be guaranteed a return on your investment and you're going to get exactly this much amount or you're going to, for one car you give you're going to get five cars in return or one house and commercializing the gospel merchandising it which is all of course uh, evil and it's wrong and that is a wrong presentation of the gospel the gospel has been associated with a lot of hype and carnality where it becomes about me, me getting my healing, me getting my uh, sense of well-being and my joy. Now, not to say that God doesn't do those things, but that's not the object of the gospel. The main objective of the gospel is to re reconcile men to God the Father so that we, be, we can be called again children of God and forgiven for our sins and be saved from eternal wrath because of the blood of of Jesus Christ. Now, God will do and does do many other wonderful things as a loving father, but the gospel is not about the hype that it's often made out to be. It's about repentance and reconnecting people with God and the removal of their sins, the removal of our sins, so that we can be called children of God and have an eternal destiny with God the Father and escape judgment and destruction in hell. And that is what the gospel saints is about. But Jesus presents a clear gospel. And uh, he doesn't mince his words in as much as he makes himself accessible to this woman. And uh, he talks to her and he finds a way, a creative way of eliciting a response from her. He also then begins to, pre he begins to present the true gospel, that the kind of worshippers that the Father is seeking, that it's not about the Samaritan way or even the Jewish way of worship. But it's about worshipping the Father in spirit and in truth. <clears throat> Excuse me. And he doesn't even skirt the issue of sin. And he begins to talk about her lifestyle. And yet he also talks about God's grace and God's heart for worship. So he presents a gospel that she can relate with. He talks about the living water. And makes her realize just how desperate she is. Because she was looking for water. It was a great effort in coming in that heat and drawing. There was, there was no electric boreholes. And she had to carry it on her head. So it made a lot of sense for her. In as much as the image of water means a lot of things. In terms of the Holy Spirit and the washing of the word. But it also meant a lot to her. Because of what she was doing in that well. And to the point where she actually begins to desire and acknowledges her need for the living water, for the gospel, for the word of truth. And saints, when the true gospel, the balanced gospel is presented, it must bring a person to a place where they realize just how desperate they are and how they need to respond and ask Jesus for that living water and ask for that help. And that's what this woman begins to do because the truth had been properly presented. Now, if we present a gospel truth that, that does not paint a true picture of people's desperation, how sin is destructive and how they cannot escape the desperateness of sin and the depravity of the flesh without the help of Jesus, then we have not fully presented the gospel. We must, saints, show people their need for Jesus Christ, their need for the washing through the word, their help they need to get from the Holy Spirit. And now it's the Holy Spirit who becomes that living water that will lead them and well up to eternal life. So it's very important. The true gospel must confront deception we live in a world for instance here in zimbabwe where there's a lot of syncretism similarly almost like what would happen with the samaritans they were like a, they had a, a concoction of many beliefs uh, including judaism in terms of their worship and uh, we live in a world where that happens in zimbabwe like i was saying for instance many people go to church but they're involved in ancestral worship which is highly demonic many people attend church but are also involved in uh, consulting uh, white government prophets, which who essentially depend on water spirits or demons, if you like to say. Many people profess to know Jesus Christ, but also worship people, and they believe that only their bishop can open the way for them to be blessed, and that is idolatry. So we've got a syncretic gospel, and when we are going to, like Jesus, preach the way he preached to the woman at the well, then we must confront all deception. We must confront the truth and tell people the truth about death, the evil of ancestral worship or Freemasonry or um, worship of angels and all these other things or 
the fallacy that you can continue to live in sin and still and claim to be a true believer, yet completely embrace a sinful lifestyle. And there are many deceptions. But the true gospel, like what happened with Jesus, confronts lies and confronts deception. So saints, let's make sure we present a 3D gospel to the world. Then the next thing that Jesus demonstrates that's very important for us as well is the importance of a Holy Ghost dependency. The use of spiritual gift, the right let me say a cutting edge application of spiritual gifts. And you see Jesus operating the gift of a word of knowledge there. The Bible tells us, uh, for instance, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, it lists many spiritual gifts which are there for believers uh, to exercise prophecy, healing, words of knowledge, words of wisdom, uh, and so forth, discernment of spirits. So many gifts, there are saints that we ought to tap into and use. Jesus himself as the Son of God, bringing forth the true and deep gospel, still tapped into spiritual gifts to make himself effective. And yes, we've just talked about a 3D gospel, that we need to understand the counsel of the gospel, the, the, the nature. What does the Bible say about sin? What does the Bible say about repentance? What does the Bible say about grace? What does the Bible say about regeneration? What does the Bible say about eternal life? And all these things, and be able to present those things. But in spite of that knowledge, which is important and foundational, we still desperately need the help of the Holy Spirit to also have the same impact that Jesus had on this woman at the well. We need to trust the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is very important in two ways, saints. Number one, he draws people's attention to Jesus Christ. So that manifestation of the Spirit's power through a word of knowledge, a word of prophecy or healing, first of all, is meant to capture people's attention, to arrest their attention so that they begin to focus on what you need to say. And secondly, the Holy Spirit is also important, saints, in the sense that he also helps people to understand. He brings revelation and conviction in terms of what the gospel is truly about. So in other words, <coughs> excuse me, you may be an amazing, fluent teacher of the gospel. But without the Holy Spirit opening people's eyes and hearts, that gospel would not mean anything to them. So saints, we need to remember that we need the help of the Holy Spirit to get people to a point where they feel, sense that conviction for sin, the need to change, the reality of their eternal destiny. And that is the work, saints, of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus used the spiritual gift and we need the power of the Holy Spirit to work. In fact, let me just read um, from 1 Corinthians 14, where Paul talks about the importance, for instance, of prophecy in a meeting. And this is 1 Corinthians 14, verse 24 to 25. And Paul is talking about how worship should take place in a congregation. And he says, But if an unbeliever or someone who does not understand comes in while everybody is prophesying, he will be convinced by all that he is a sinner and will be judged by all. And the secrets of his heart will be laid bare. So he will fall down and worship God, exclaiming, God is really among you because of the operation of the prophetic. And saints, we must not neglect the ministries of the Holy Spirit. We must not neglect the role of the prophetic in the present day church, yes, we must, we must teach the word rightly, divide the word of truth. That is foundational. That is mandatory. But with that, we need saints, the aid, the help of the Holy Spirit. That's why Jesus called him the helper. Because he's going to help people to come to a place of conviction. And he's the one who brings transformation. It's the Spirit of God. That's why even Paul at one point said that, one man plants a seed, another man waters it, but only God can make the seed grow or bring increase. In other words, spiritual transformation ultimately only comes from God himself. And that is the work of the Holy Spirit. So saints, in spite of our expert knowledge of the gospel, the word of God, we still need the work and the manifestation of the Holy Spirit. And we must not quench the manifestation of spiritual gifts. Then the last thing, that we see in this passage is that when the true gospel is preached, there is always a divine collision between truth and lies. 
And uh, ultimately, when that takes place, of course, we know the gospel wins. Jesus said, I'll build my church and against it, the gates of hell will not prevail. It's incredible what happens with this woman. That the moment she hears the truth and receives it, she is transformed. At one point, she's this woman who's had a series of broken marriages, broken relationships. She is a woman of controversy, confused about spiritual things. But suddenly she becomes possibly the first evangelist ever recorded in the Bible. And she starts drawing people to Jesus. That is instant, powerful transformation. Which is what happens, saints, when the true gospel clashes with deception and lies. There is a, an instant chemical reaction. And it results in the spreading of light. The kingdom of God is always stronger. The Bible says the light shines in the darkness. The darkness cannot overcome the light. And that's what happened with this woman. She received the truth and instantly purpose began to arise within her. Hope began to arise. Courage to do the right thing. Joy. You can sense the excitement in her voice as you read the story. Because she had received the true gospel. And that's what happens. That's why we must make sure that we do present the true gospel to people when we talk to them. Because the true gospel has this effect. Even on the worst of the worst, so to speak. When we tell people the truth about how, who Jesus is, we rely on the Holy Spirit to give us words of knowledge and prophecy to reveal just what's happening with them. And then we apply the gospel to those specific areas. Sometimes you may be dealing some, with someone who's suicidal and they're about to kill themselves. And the Holy Spirit shows you. And as you're sharing the gospel, you share with them that the, that's what the Lord is revealing to you. And suddenly their hearts become more open and Jesus impacts them. And when that's what happens since when we present the proper and the true gospel, there's a reaction. It reminds me of one time when I was in a stationery shop looking for certain things. And I was just talking to this lady who was checking. She was a security lady. She was checking the things I'd bought. And uh, I just struck conversation with her about uh, spirituality. And she told me the church she goes to. And happens to be one of the a church of one of these so-called big prophets in this nation, in quotes. And I said, oh, well, that's fine. As long as you're following Jesus and not a man. And you, the reaction that came out from that woman. She suddenly became so angry, I couldn't understand it. Until, of course, I discerned that that was the, the spirit of the Antichrist. The Bible tells us that though the Antichrist is not manifested, his spirit is already at work. And she was angry. Why? Because the true gospel provokes a reaction in terms of the darkness. It will either bring repentance, or if the person doesn't want to repent, it will cause an anger and a negativity. But there will always be a reaction, saint, when you preach the true gospel. And we must not be afraid of that, and we must not hold back from preaching the true gospel. As Jesus was a friend of sinners, we saw the impact. Some rejected, some received. But for those who were seeking, Hope was restored and sinners repented. So saints, I pray that this series on Jesus, a friend of sinners, has helped us and inspired us to learn from Jesus Christ how to reach the church, to reach the prodigals, to reach the world, demonstrate the love of Jesus Christ, but without compromising the truth of the gospel and with the aid of the Holy Spirit. So be blessed, saints, and meditate on this word and Let's draw from Jesus, the friend of sinners, and have the same impact through the gospel and the Holy Spirit in the world in which we live. Be blessed in Jesus' name.